Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, joined today by Mike Burns, the co-founder and the CEO of Strat Simple. Hey, how are you? I'm good, Julia. How are you? Great. Okay. You know, we titled this before you roll your eyes. There are new methods for strategic planning. And we're really excited to learn from you, Mike, because this is one of those topics that people either love or they hate or they just dread. I mean, I hate to be like selling this down, but I mean, it seems like it's such a struggle and yet everyone agrees that it's really important. So we're really excited to have you on the show today to kind of help us make some sense of why we need to be looking at strategic planning and how we can maybe look at it differently. Um, before we get started, I want to make sure that I extend a strategic welcome. How about that, huh? Pretty, pretty damn good, Mike. Come on. Well done. Uh, our strategic gratitude goes out to Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staff and Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, our new show on Fridays, just dedicated to fundraising. It's super cool. And then 180 Management Group. If you've been with us um, in the last, oh, 45, 60 days, you've been meeting our new co-hosts. They're just amazing. They come from all over the country. They do very different things in the nonprofit sector, incredibly diverse in terms of where they work and where they serve and who they serve. It's just been a fascinating thing to get to know these folks. Um, they're a lot of fun. So I hope you've enjoyed meeting them alongside with me. Mike Burns, okay, co-founder and CEO of Strat Simple. What is Strat Simple? Because strategy is never simple, my friend. <laughs> it's not, but you know, it's one of those things that you mentioned before you roll your eyes. One of the, the greatest compliments we've ever had for what we do is somebody saying, wow, it doesn't have to be as painful as I thought it did, right? That's sort of yeah. our goal is how do we make this easy? And so what we do is we are a software provider. We write yeah. software that uses AI to automate all the parts of strategic planning that can be automated and intentionally not automating the stuff that shouldn't be. And we try to mm -hmm. simplify down the work to have a high quality strategic planning. And because we simplify so much, it can be at a lot lower cost. And so that's really why we built Strat Simple was to help make quality strategic planning more accessible to nonprofits that maybe couldn't access those kinds of capabilities in the past. Wow. Okay. So in the green room, um, we had this fascinating conversation and I would love to kind of pull it back in. Um, we go by the number on the nonprofit show, 1.8 million registered nonprofits in the US. We all know that those designations come through the IRS. And you made a comment that kind of chilled me. Um, talk about what your, your stat is when it comes to nonprofits and strategic planning. Yeah, absolutely. So our, our research shows that about half of nonprofits don't have any strategic plan at all. And when we're out talking with, with clients, it's interesting. The folks that do have a strategic plan uh, tend to often be something that was done years ago. You know, it might be sort of in that proverbial binder up on a shelf. They don't really run the, you know, the organization off it on a regular basis. So I don't have a, a great sort of thumb on the pulse of how many have a high quality strategic plan, but it's nowhere near as many as, as they need. To be, so. You know, it's so shocking. And, and I can think of like so many situations where, you, you do all this work and generally it's through a board retreat or, you know, even an, an office retreat kind of thing. Everybody gets together. Everybody's kind of grumpy about it to be candid. No one's like, woohoo, strategy yep. session, you know, and then you do all this hard work. Somebody goes back, puts it together. It gets sent out for review. Nobody ever says anything. And then it, it goes in that binder on the bookshelf, just exactly what you said, Mike. But then somebody remembers it or gets reminded maybe through a calendar notice, like, holy moly, the year's coming up. We better get that out and see where we are. Yeah. And because no one's paid attention to it, it's an abject failure. And then everybody's like emotionally beat up because you're like, we suck. We didn't make any of our goals. Yep. It, does that sound familiar? Sounds like so familiar. That's exactly what we're looking to solve, right? And so I, um, you know, part of our platform is giving people a tool where they can actually track that stuff and live in it. And I, I sometimes refer to people, imagine if you had to drive your car without a dashboard. You didn't know how fast you were going. You don't know how much gas you have left. Imagine how stressful that would be. 
Well, that's sort of what a lot of nonprofits are doing, right? They're driving their organization without a dashboard, and, and that's just harder than it needs to be. I've got to ask this question. One of the things at the dawn of the pandemic um, was people were like, well, that's ridiculous. The strategic plan is out the door because of a global pandemic, blah, blah. And we're not going to work on it. We're not going to review it. We're not going to attempt to do a next one. So then we kind of have like, you know, a, a hard three years, closer to five years for some organizations where things are, you know, changed and different. I'm wondering if a lot of folks didn't just take that that exercise off the board table and not even return to it. I, I think you might be right. And a lot of organizations were like, wow, this failed. Like, let's not do it again to your point. I think others, yeah. though, also learned that that three to five year planning cycle just doesn't work nowadays. And so, you know, my background started in the for-profit world doing a strategic planning where it's usually done on a one-year cycle with a long-term view. Mm -hmm. Coming into the nonprofit space, one of our big learnings has been that this historical approach has been to do a three or five-year plan. Yeah. I think COVID taught a lot of people that there's some major downsides to looking at things that way. And so as we're working with folks now, it's much more common for people to be looking for a reoccurring one-year planning with that long-term mm -hmm. view, which I think is way healthier. So that's a, a good change from my perspective. Wow. You know, that that's fascinating to me. And and I think that um, as quickly as, as society is changing and technology within society and the nonprofit sector, I kind of appreciate that. I think maybe that is a better, a healthier way to go. Well, let's get into this because you mentioned, and it was just part of a sentence, that your company uses AI and what does that look like in terms of strategic planning? I mean, ChatGPT is my friend, but I'm like, how does this all fit together? Absolutely. And so that's sort of where I geek out a little bit. And I'm not going to unleash my full geek on you, I assure you. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> but yeah, we really set out to say, you know, how can we automate this work? And, and the interesting thing is you wouldn't have been able to build a company like Strat Simple just a couple of years ago because the technology didn't exist. That's how fast things are changing, right? So yeah. um, we use AI in a couple major places. We use it to do our actual interviews. And so there's automated interviewing that's happening. We use it for coaching to set goals. But I think whenever anyone asks me this question, it's as important to say what we don't use it for, which okay. is we have a really strong opinion that people are, I mean, strategic planning is fundamentally a human effort, right? And mm -hmm. so while we provide software, we also partner with consultants that go in and do the facilitation and work with the negotiation because there's stuff that AI is never going to be the solution for, right? So we're really cognizant to make sure we're using it in the right places. Interesting, because that was one of my questions. Um, I was It was kind of floating around, bouncing around in the back of my brain was, how does this get uh, facilitated so that you don't have people get frustrating, getting frustrated by the software component, but they're they're you know they're having that guide because you know i'm sure you've been involved in this too where you the difference between strategic planning is really success and failure is how it's led i mean that's my opinion i've been in rooms where it's like okay let's do this and then everybody's like well what do we do versus i've been in rooms where there was a, a dedicated professional facilitator and it's like wow what a difference so absolutely can you talk to us about that a little yeah, absolutely. So like where you know, our consultant partners get excited is there are very few consultants out there that we talk to that get really excited about having to do hundreds of hours of interviews and synthesize that information together. What they get excited about is being in the room, helping the leadership team build the strategy. And so where we start is because we're using AI, one of the neat things that happens is if you've ever done strategic planning, how many people really get interviewed or put in a focus group? A couple dozen, yeah. right? Because we're using AI to do this, when we work with clients, we are interviewing sometimes hundreds or thousands of constituents to get their feedback because AI can do it. We can do it at massive scale and we can do it in the languages that the participants prefer. So the AI can work in Spanish wow. or French or Arabic. And so we can be more inclusive and, and respective of diversity. And so there's some neat stuff comes out of using AI. Okay. I love that because I live in the desert Southwest and that's one of my big bugaboos is that we, um, in my state, we were part of Mexico only 150 years ago. We have a very large population of Spanish-speaking people, native and otherwise. 
And yet we don't see enough Spanish being used when we talk about everything from fundraising to client services. So, wow, that just like hit a button for me. I absolutely love that. And I think it's super powerful. Let's talk about one of these aspects that we're bandying about bandying about OKRs. Yeah. And everybody's like, oh yeah, OKRs. Talk to us about this because I don't think we are all in agreement as to what this means. You got it. So if, if you're not running into it, OKR stands for Objective and Key Result. And it is the most popular goal setting framework out there. So it came about at Google from like the 1990s. So it's been out there for like 25 years. But the big focus with OKRs is it's about tracking results and not activities. And so many historical strategic plans have been about, we're gonna do this thing and then we're gonna do that thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when you change to OKRs, it's about, we're gonna get this result and that result. And if you've ever worked for an organization that's telling you exactly what to go do, it doesn't feel empowering, right? You, you've got this checklist that, you know, some greater power has told you to go do these things. Yeah. And instead what OKRs do is say, hey, here's the outcomes we want and we trust you to figure out how to go and get it done. And it's just, it's a complete cultural game changer to change people's focus from activities to outcomes. And that's what OKR has really helped people do. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so interesting that you you framed it up that way because one of the big trends and everybody's talking about this is trust philanthropy, where funders are saying, yeah, we're going to trust you, XYZ organization, to you know, build a better mousetrap or do whatever it is. And then we would, we'd like for you to report back, but we're not going to have these really draconian uh, measurements and systems that we don't even really understand ourselves. And so this is kind of like that whole mindset shift, if you will, in our sector. Absolutely. And it's interesting too, because one of the other superpowers that comes out of OKRs is the sort of really intentional focus it's not uncommon when you hear people complaining about past strategic plans that they had 15 or 20 priorities. You don't yeah. have many priorities if you have that many priorities, right? Like, right. so with OKRs, you're focused on three to five things and, and it doesn't matter who the audience is. It could be your community, it could be your funders, but when you sort of lay out and say, look, here's the three things we're gonna go do, that resonates with people. Like to your point, it, it reinforces that trust philanthropy because you're, you're really being clear about communicating what you're gonna get done. And I've got to believe, Mike, that, and again, I'm just speaking from my own uh, lens, that um, the, these decisions and this planning occurs with a small group of people, generally the board, but then it's turned over to staff who was not a part of the discussion necessarily, and yet they're charged with, you know, task management to achieving the OKRs, right? Everything in between. So um, that to me is kind of an interesting aspect of it because you can be doing tasks that you might as an employee or a leader go, this is ridiculous. This, do this doesn't have impact. Absolutely. It, it's interesting too. So it's, it's one of the things that is so different in the nonprofit space. And that was a big learning for me when we started working here, which is, you know, in the for-profit world, the executive team sort of builds these strategies in a vacuum. The board might have some influence, but it's, it's really done by that small group. In the nonprofit space, there are so many more voices and constituencies yeah. that have perspective. And the board and, and the leadership team really need to work together to do that. And so the way that we try to, to steer clients towards doing this is really, to your point, the executive director and the team are the ones that are going to live in this day to day. They really yeah. have to drive the strategic planning process. But we want to make sure from day zero, the board is included, they're giving input, they're sharing their wisdom and their insights, and they're having a chance to sort of sign it off on this plan. But we really want to empower the executive director and their team to, to build a plan that they can get behind. Because to your point, there's this famous saying, you know, do it with them, not to them. If you give someone a strategic plan and say, go do this, you, you've <laughs> lost buy-in before you even started, right? It's the worst. And I think a lot of times, you know, people that are in the trenches have a completely granted it's warranted different point of view. Absolutely. And so decisions that are, you know, passed down or through are going to be like, why are we even messing with this? This isn't, this isn't of a value um, to what we're trying to do. 
let's get into this transparency and accountability factors. You know, we talked, Mike, early on that a lot of times organizations don't even monitor really where they are until they're like on deadline. And a lot of times that's like a year out or some horrible <laughs> thing. Um, what do you mean by accountability and that transparency factor? Like, how does software help us engage in this? Uh, considering yeah. that we're used to working on the binder in the out of the binder on the shelf. You got it. So I, I think, you know, it's either a binder or it's everyone's next favorite tool, Excel, right? That tends to yeah. be the other solution people are using for this. And how many yeah. of us have chased around who has the last version, who put in their updates? Yeah. Like it's just a disaster, right? So, yeah. um, and that's what OKR software really helps you do. And the, the way we look at it is if you go back to that analogy I shared earlier about the car, we really want all of the performance data to be in one place. So in simple, we actually show like the KPIs up top. And, and that's one of the things we tend to work with clients is on like, what's the difference between a key performance indicator and an OKR? If you haven't done this before, it can be kind of confusing, right? Um, but we always like to talk about the fact that um, KPIs are sort of a health indicator. Like if we were looking at our body, it might be something like blood pressure. My doctor's always gonna care what my blood pressure is, but I might have a goal for this year to make myself healthier to say, I'm gonna win a marathon. And that, that would be my objective. Objectives are about like changing the status quo. And part of the accountability is just putting a line in the sand and saying, this is what we're going to do. That's where the power of objectives comes from. And then that other part underneath key results is it looks a lot like a smart goal that many of us have heard where they're measurable and they're assigned to a specific person. But the power that comes out of this is when every part of the strategic plan is assigned to one person. And by the way, that scares people terribly when we tell them. We're, and what we're saying is you're not responsible for all the work. You're just the one accountable for making sure that the rest of the organization knows how it's going. Right. Right. You're the champion of it. You're the champion of it. That's a perfect yeah. word. Right. Yeah, yeah. And so what happens, like the way we approach this is everyone ha owns their goals, the deliverables, mm -hmm. and the system's actually asking them for updates on a regular basis. Generally, do we do weekly updates because... We actually want to break that big year plan into quarterly plans as well, because honestly, building an actionable plan 12 months out is very hard to predict sometimes the details of what would need to happen in Q4, right? And so you break it into smaller pieces, you, you break it out and you assign it to people, and then they're doing their updates on a regular basis. And that, it's silly, but it works. The act of thinking about it on a regular basis and saying, here's where we're at, are we on target, are we off target, it's transformative to actually getting stuff done. Mm -hmm. I gotta believe, Mike, that it gives uh, organizations, leaders, um, an opportunity to say no. It sure it does. Right? That, and that's, you're right. That's one of the things we cover in strategy. That is, to me, that's what strategy is. The strategy is saying no to the right things so that you're focused on the few most important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, super powerful because you know, in the nonprofit sector, and I'm sure you've observed this time and time again, we run from one fire to another. Right. And so it's really hard to step back, take a deep breath and say, OK, what, what's really the bigger picture here? And, um, you know, what is it that we're working towards? It might seem uh, like it doesn't link up to what's going on here and now today. But ultimately, what does that look like for the whole ecosystem of our organization? Hey, before we move on to my next question, we have somebody that's uh, written in a question. Um, we're using a new pl a platform you all. And so we have opportunities for people to send in questions live from LinkedIn, X and YouTube live. So um, this question came in. I, I don't know where it came from. Um, but Marcus writes, do you have training for strategic planning and strategic execution? We do. And, and there's a lot more to come. So we are focused on building out the software right now. But if, if you go to stretchsimple.com, there's a resources section where we actually have training available on sort of best practices for this stuff. So yeah, definitely awesome. check it out. Awesome. Well, you know, that's a, a an interesting thing because basically it sounds to me like we got to start with some of these these ideas first, right? It's not just about a plug and play kind of piece of software that we got to understand what the process is and what we're doing, especially for an organization that maybe hasn't been doing this, maybe has been doing it the old way, but they want to change it up. Um, kind of a new dawn. I feel like maybe this is going to give this time and place where we are, Mike, is going to give people permission to try something new. Absolutely. And it's it's so interesting, too. And, and, and it's so common. The thing you talked about earlier <clears throat> is this idea that the board would build the plan, give it to the team, 
<laughs> We've already covered why that's wrong, but just think about the fact that we're not even listening to the communities and stuff too. Like one of the things that comes out of this broader listening concept is it, it never happens that one of our clients doesn't learn something new or an insight where they're like, oh, wow, like that's what our clients need. You don't find that stuff out unless you go out and talk to the people that you're helping, right? And so that is so fundamental to strategic planning. Um, and it, it makes me sad when organizations aren't doing that listening first because it's so critical. So talk to us about this then in terms of, and, and we don't have a lot of time left, but help us understand the framework and what somebody should be looking at. Because as I mentioned to you, and and, and again, I'm just being self-reflective of, of the many, many organizations I've been involved in with this process. Um, it's like a long weekend or a long day. Yes. But, and again, it's just the, the few people in the room, right? When you're looking at this, where we're, we're taking a, an a in-depth look with the people that we work with, we fund, we serve, what, how much time is this going to take? Because this is pretty arduous. It, it normally is. You're right. And so that's sort of where the software and the AI comes in. So I told, told you about the interviews, but the other part is we have a separate AI that reads through all of those interviews and synthesizes all the resu results and the insights, right? So instead of taking weeks to read through hundreds of responses, you're getting a condensed PowerPoint deck and some supplemental data that says, hey, here's what you need to know to build this. And so when we partner with consultants and facilitators, that's what they love, right? Because we've just given them more time to focus on the stuff where they add the most value because that, right. that just data crunching is done automatically. Um, so that ends up being really helpful, right? So you end up, you know, we think about the fact that after listening, the next important step is aligning the major stakeholders on what matters. And having that data, it helps separate the opinions from facts. And, and when everyone's looking at things through the same lens of, hey, we've, we've asked the community, here's what they're saying. Boy, is it a big step towards getting everybody on the same page because it's it's hard to look at those facts and say, oh, well, I looked at it differently, but maybe I'm changing my mind because I see the new data coming. in. Okay, so then let's go to that next level. Yeah. How do you communicate back to your stakeholders of what you've learned? I mean, because it's one thing to gather data and to interview somebody, but I feel like there's a missing link when we don't go back to those folks and say, this is what we learned. I mean, do you advocate that or or do you feel like that's just a part of you in, in your discovery journey? No, I hugely, hugely agree okay. with you, right? So like, I think it's one of the ways to build this as a sustainable process going forward is everyone that you're asking has to feel like they were heard, right? So yeah. as you finish the strategic plan, one of the things that we talk about is organizational alignment and communication. And one of those really important steps of communications is how are you going to communicate this plan out to all the constituencies that we just interviewed on what was important to them? Mm -hmm. That really closed, to your point, that closes the loop. And it's so important that people aren't just like, wow, you asked me my opinion and never heard back. Thanks. That's right. a good way to not get people to participate next time. It's a, it is a horrible feeling because you're in a vacuum and you're like, well, did I say something wrong? Or am I the only person that thinks this? I mean, it's an, it's an awful uh, piece of, of this process to be asked for wisdom and to really give up your time and your, your resources um, and then, you know, never hear back. Now, I'm fascinated by this because it seems to me back in the day, the strategic plan was kind of secretive. I mean, we never shared it. Um, I can remember, you know, back in the day on every piece of paper at the bottom, sheet, you know, in that binder, confidential. I mean, you, you didn't, um, you didn't share bottom line. Can you talk to us about this and what your thoughts are? To me, that's been a mindset shift in, in what good strategic planning looks like, right? Like okay. if you keep it secret, how does your team know what they're supposed to be moving towards? Right. And, and that's, I, <laughs> and good strategic planning is about getting the whole organization rowing in the same direction, right? So on the contrary, I would say shout it from the rooftops. Like mm -hmm. if the worst thing that happens is your community knows what you're focused on and your funders know what you're focused on and your team knows what you're focused on, mm -hmm. it's hard for me to see downsides from that. Yeah. Right. And so it's it's one of these famous things where people say, you know, share your secrets and your implementation is really the secret sauce, right? It, the, the power isn't in what you're planning on doing. The magic happens when you actually execute. I love that. I think that's a fascinating thing. How do you advise us to do that? I mean, is this something that should be 
on our our websites as we're going through the journey? Is it just reported out at the end of our our time frame? Like, how do we navigate this, especially as this is a living, breathing, ever evolving aspect of our business? I love that question. And so we, we actually have a, a cadence that we recommend clients go through. And so it starts with doing this, the listening and planning process annually. So that's the, the start of the flywheel. Mm -hmm. But then every quarter, really doing a retrospective and saying, look at the last three months, what went well, what didn't go well, what do we need to tweak and adjust as we go forward, right? Because it's a living document. It shouldn't be carved in stone. Yeah. But then even deeper than that, we really preach that the management team should be looking at this stuff at least on a monthly basis, right? Mm -hmm. And then giving kudos when things are going well and reaching out to offer assistance when people need help. And that's really when the team gets behind it. When they realize the leadership is actually looking at this thing and, you know, the ED reaches out to you and says, congratulations, like you're doing really good on your project. Mind blowing for people, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, we, we really want to see this not being an academic plan on the shelf. We really want to see the team living in it and adjusting in it and, and working together in it. So the last phase of this, and I, I'm going to witness to you that I'm in my personal uh, phase of strategic planning that I do every year. And this year I'm completely, I'm doing it in a different way. Um, I've done it the same for probably close to 30 years. Never really had a year where I'm like, woohoo, yay, yeah. I'm, I've, I'm always disappointed in myself. And this is very personal. It's not like I share it with anybody, right? Yeah. Um, how are you or what do you think we should be doing about grading? Like about, which thing? Know, about grading, like our, you know, like were we A, B, Cs, were we great, bet, you know, medium, bad? I mean, because I think, and maybe that's one of the problems where I'm at, is that I'm stuck in this, I need to be graded mentality. What do you think about this? And what should we be thinking about? Yeah. So as part of the process that we help clients through, we actually have the executive director or CEO do their own, we call it a vision deck, right? And part of that is a retrospective on how did we do on last year? And we asked them to grade how this top, so that's exactly what we do. And frequently I have people asking me like, well, how do I do that? I don't want to upset people by saying that, you know, we got a D or an F and I completely yeah. get that, right? At the end of the day, this, this whole process is not meant to be punitive. It's meant to be helpful and move people forward. And so what we find is, you know, even if the ED thinks something was an abject failure, we probably don't want to do that kind of criticism in public. Those kinds of criticisms are best met privately, one-on-one -on -one kind of thing, okay. right? And so we, we want to be sensitive to the fact that we're building a team and that we want to have psychological safety. And so, you know, even the worst failures, when publicly discussed with names attached, probably look more like a C than an F, right? There might be harder conversations in the background, but we don't want to embarrass people and I feel strongly about that. You know, if you've ever worked for someone who's sort of aggressive and calling you out in public, mm -hmm. it, it really shuts you down and makes you not want to give your best in the future. And so I think that's a really important part of being a leader in any organization is being sensitive and empathetic to how your behavior makes other people feel. Yeah. And I think you have to be careful as you're doing that grading to make sure you're getting the outcomes you want. So sort start with the end in mind and make sure your grading helps you get there. So do you, as part of this, do you wait uh, these these um, OKRs up front so that you can be um, kind of seeing what your grade, and again, correct me if you think there's a different word, but you know, where you are or how is, is that just done at the end or is it done differently for everyone? How, what does that look like? That's an awesome question. So with OKRs, we're actually calculating sort of the performance achieved with the objective. Every time anyone in the company does an update, we're automatically calculating that. So when, okay. when the team's doing its monthly check-ins, you're seeing like, oh, we're, you know, 65% of the way done with this. That's awesome. Okay. And so it takes a little bit of the subjectivity away from, from the performance on the objectives. Mm -hmm. um, and because all of those key results are really measurable. If you said you're going to raise $100,000 this year and you've raised $40,000 this year, I don't really need to make a subjective judgment. The data is what the data is, right? And so mm -hmm. it, it, that from that perspective, it eliminates some subjectiveness from it when you're mm -hmm. looking at the, the actual data. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's really an argument for being precise and um, really I would say disclosing or labeling or defining those OKRs up front, as opposed to we're going to do better. Absolutely. We're going to serve more people. Yeah, that sounds great. But how many more people are you going to serve? Right. What does doing better look like? I mean, yep. that's the heavy lift up front, right? A hundred percent. And 
one of the neat things you do when you set up OKRs is you actually want to target them so that the most for about an 80% performance, because you don't want these to be so easy that they're just easy and done. You want people to really push and strive for more. Mm -hmm. And so getting them calibrated just right is an art, right? You want to say, hey, if we think it's a no-brainer that we're going to raise 100000 maybe we set the goal to 120 and we celebrate if we get to 100. But yeah. you calibrate it so that people are challenged to, to push just a little bit further than they might be coming. Yeah, I like that. Well, Mike Burns, co-founder and CEO of Strat Simple. Um, I love this conversation. I love that in my lifetime, I've seen such a change with how we even think about this. Um, I think it's much healthier and much stronger of an environment now with, with some of these redevelopments of, of how we strategize. And so I love that you have a product that can you know, fuse into the digital age. I think it's really exciting. And I, I give you and your team a lot of credit. Check out stratsimple.com. You can learn about Mike Burns and his team, what they're doing, their philosophies. Um, I would imagine that this is also a place where you can find um, the the folks that, you know, can engage with you um, to help you on, along this journey, correct? You got it, absolutely. When people reach out to us, we partnering them with a consultant in, our, in their area. So we want to keep the cost down. So we don't try to eliminate traveling and find a local partner that we've vetted. And those partners have been trained on the software. And so they come in and they can use these tools to get you a strategic plan that you will be thrilled with. So that's the right place to go to start and learn. I love it. Well, really exciting. And this has just been a wonderful um, connection. And I, I think you've, you've really come up with something. So congratulations. Hey, I want to make sure that we thank all of our presenting sponsors because they are here day in and day out. So we can have these really interesting conversations like we've had with Mike Burns today. And our partners include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, and 180 Management Group. These are the folks that help us with our strategic plan, Mike, if you will. Um, and so thank you so much to them. You know, Mike, every episode we uh, end the show with this message and I hear it differently in my head. And today I'm thinking about the value of strategic planning and how it, it becomes part of our organizational health. And the message is simple, but it's complex at the same time. And it goes like this, to stay well, so you can do well. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you back here.